It's always nice to see people that you rock with, to see them grow, uh, to see them take things to a whole nother level, to see them have uh, just a lot of success in whatever it is that they're choosing to do. Uh, that's why this special guest that we're bringing on for this episode, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to have him come on the show, especially just having watched him start from the bottom and now he's here. Um, and he has continued to, to elevate um, and to just be so original and unique with his perspective, uh, with his takes, with his style, with just everything that he does. Um, so let's get into this episode. Uh, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all watching. This should be a fun one. Yeah, this feels like a dream. Team Keep It Clean, uh, in this episode, we welcome a very, very special guest. Uh, and you know what's crazy? I was actually, um, a couple of days ago, I was looking at an old video from, I want to say it was right before 2019, right before that season, um, where you had came out to the Ravens open practice. Um, and we recorded the video like right in front of the, uh, the, the Ray Lewis statue. Um, and I'm like, man, shout out to Quincy because it done came a long way. YouTube, team keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video along with Quincy Carrier from the Worst Take channel. You guys might know me from covering the Browns when I'm here watching the Ravens with Engraven today. That's what's up, man. Y'all come through, say what's up, man. <laughs> hey, Tyrone McIntyre from Baltimore. That's my son. My name is Ty Reese. You can find me on Instagram at boy.ty, L-O-R dot T Y Y E. All right, there it goes. You can go ahead and Aaron Butler, go Ravens. All right. With engraving. What's up? Go Ravens. Go way, go way. But anyway, what we're here to talk about today is um some. Now you like the 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 face of the Browns community on YouTube. Um, I, I can now call you uh credentials Quincy. <laughs> uh, cause, shout out to you because that, that that was cool because I, I was super happy for you though seeing you like actually not just cover brown's training camp but actually be there be part of the media be there at the uh the actual presses so before we get into everything going on with the browns like how how, how was that how did that feel and and of course welcome back to the channel yeah when you get into it a non-traditional way you know, like I did that whole time. It felt like I snuck over the fence. Like I was waiting for somebody to throw me out the whole time. I'm like, man, am I supposed to be here? But then you look at your badge. You're like, no, nah, that's my name. That's my name. I'm supposed to, I'm allowed to be here. It was weird during like the press conferences because like I could have asked the question, but I was like, this is, you know, you feel like your first day at rookie camp or something like that where you, you see all the, the people you've been watching your whole life mm -hmm. and you're like, man, they're out here. Well, I don't want to mess them up. You know what I mean? So you kind of just kind of watch and, and take note. But it, it's interesting just being able to mingle and, and meet people who, mm -hmm. who do this and meet people who watch my channel who's able to see me at camp because I was mm -hmm. just very visible there, you know, when you're within the ropes. And it's just interesting to just be that close to an NFL practice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a fortunate opportunity that I'm very thankful for. Um, and you know, I like to think I worked hard for it, you know, um, and yeah, for you know, sure. it, it's, it's another step, man. Sometimes I forget how far I've come in this game. Like it's easy to forget your own successes when you're in the middle of trying to build more success because you don't take a lot of time to stop and look. But, you know, in my mind, I still think of myself as the kid, the 12 year old kid that used to have his, uh, his dad's portable radio up on like local sports talk just so I could hear all the sports talk while I would sleep in um, and, and try to miss school every day. <laughs> well, it, it, it definitely, uh, definitely worked out for you. So keep, keep, keep doing what you've been doing. Now, um, a team that has continued to keep doing what they've been doing uh, and they make headlines every single off season without fail. I think that could be good. It could be bad. It could be a little bit of both. Um, is the Cleveland Browns, your Cleveland Browns. Um, I wanted to wait 
to bring you on uh, until we got clarity on how long Deshaun Watson was going to be out for. First, a couple weeks ago, it seemed like we had some clarity. Then the NFL was like, ah, no, that ain't enough. But now we have full clarity. So he's going to be out for, what, 11 games, I believe? 11 weeks, yes. Okay. So first, how do you feel about Brown's quarterback situation during that time frame, during that span of those 11 games that Deshaun Watson is going to be out for? Uh, do you think they can hold it down while he's gone so when he does come back, they can be like, all right, Deshaun, here go the keys, lead us for the rest of the season because we right there in the thick of things, or do you think it's more like a lost cause? I feel like it's as good as it could be, right? Like, that's where I'm at. I don't think necessarily, like, I'm not going to sit you and tell you starting Jacoby Brissett for 11 games is like a great situation. Like, a great situation is starting Patrick Mahomes for 11 games. That's a great situation. Jacoby Brissett is an okay situation, right? Mm -hmm. Is just as okay, if not, in my opinion, I think it's a little bit better than like Jimmy Garoppolo or any of the other options that have been floated out there. Given that he's been in the camp, he, he's familiar with the guys, he has a nice rapport with uh, Amari Cooper, and he'll be all right. It's a okay enough situation. Um, and my expectations for them aren't wild in that period. I don't think this is a lost cause season, though, because last year, this team was in playoff contention up until week 16, well, 17, when 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 Baker gave T.J. Watt the sack record. Again, T.J., you should really pay Baker some money or whatever bonus you got for winning that because he, he legit gave you that award. But I digress. Um, but, you know, up until that point, the Browns were not just in it to win the division, but they were in it to make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And... That was with Baker Mayfield, whatever you want to say, caused it, right? There's arguments on what caused it. Was it his level of play? Was it the labrum? Or was it just him? There's all kind of arguments on the internet about that. I'm not about to get into that. But no matter what you can say about what caused it, what happened is undeniable. He was awful, right? Um, and if you look at PF, PFF grades, I believe he was 30th of all quarterbacks. If you look at QBR, he was 27th, right? So last year with bottom five quarterback play, according to the, both those advanced metrics, mm. you had bottom five quarterback play. And the question to me isn't, and you still were able to win eight games. The question to me isn't, is Jacoby Brissett going to be great? No, Jacoby Brissett's not going to be in the top 10 of QBR or PFF grades. But can Jacoby Brissett be marginally, if not significantly better than bottom five? I think there's a strong possibility that he could be 20th to 15th, right? Like, if they, that's the best case scenario, you get 20th to 15th quarterback play out of him. Um, and if that's what you can get out of him, I think with the strength of this team, which is the defense, you have Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, Amari Cooper. I mean, the names that you can list on this team are endless. It's almost like an ultimate team roster, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... Since you have that, what you need out the quarterback is just somebody who is not going to put you in bad situations. Another thing with Baker was it's not just the play that was bad. His style of play was not helpful to the defense, which is he takes a lot of sacks. He gets yeah. behind the sticks. He turns the ball over often, right? Those are things that's not going to help a defensive-oriented team and a team that wants to run the ball a lot. Jacoby Brissett, while he's not going to be as explosive as Baker Mayfield, he doesn't turn the ball over much. He doesn't get behind the sticks. He's he's like prime Joe Flacco, right? Just get rid of the ball before he takes that sack. You know, so he's a better quarterback if you want to play field position and run the ball um, than Baker Mayfield. He's a better option for that style of football. Baker was never a good fit for that. Baker's more of a run and gun, let's score a bunch of points, Big 12 type situation. Um, Jacoby's more of a fit for this. So I think that although they're downgrading in talent at quarterback, no, undoubtedly, Baker's a more talented quarterback. Mm -hmm. they're upgrading in a fit with quarterback, right? Now, I could be wrong on that. Jacoby Brissett could just be awful, right? That's not out the realm of possibility. But I do feel like this is a situation where the coaching staff is getting the style of quarterback play that they at least want if it's not going to be a franchise guy, which is somebody who's not going to turn the ball over, going to play safe football. We're going to be able to play field position with him and let the defense win these games and our running game win these games. The quarterback is not going to be asked to win a bunch of games here. Um and I think that's pretty much the game plan going forward. I mean, it's a very similar game plan to what, you know, Ravens were doing with Joe Flacco, what 
the Steelers were doing with Ben Roethlisberger at the end of his career. It's a game plan that works. It's just, is Jacoby Brissett good enough to execute it? I think there's numbers that suggest he is. Hmm. Okay. And and just to, to switch gears a little bit, and we'll switch back to the Browns in just a minute, but you brought up Mr. Baker Mayfield. And, of course, he was traded to the Carolina Panthers. Um, based off of what you said, I feel like I know what the answer is going to be, but I still got to ask anyway, how do you think Baker Mayfield is going to do over it with the Panthers? I worry about whether that was the right place for him to go mm. just because it seems like a hectic situation and it seems like things might happen there that are out of his control, right? You got a coach who's probably going to be fired in the middle or at the end of the year and Matt Rule. Um, and I know from experience when coaches are in that situation, I mean, more than anybody in this division, the Browns have fired a ton of guys. <laughs> when coaches are in that situation, they do odd stuff. Remember when the Browns were like seven and four in first place with Brian Hoyer and just threw Johnny football in there, right? Like it's just stuff happens. That's weird. That's out of the player's control in those situations. Um, and, and that's what I'm worried about with Baker. Now, Sam Darnold, I, I don't know what the seriousness of his injury is, but if that is a more serious injury, unfortunately for Sam and fortunately for Baker, it does give him more security where they just can't bench him on a whim, which I felt like was a possibility um, there. I worry about that style of offense he's in. It's very similar to Kevin, the, the, the Freddie Kitchen style of offense that he was in. And, he threw a lot of interceptions. And look, Baker Mayfield, I, I try to say this a lot, right? And people say it's hating or I'm, uh, I'm being too nice to him. I can't win with an opinion about Baker. But the reality with him is people say he's Andy Dalton or Joe Flacco, right? That's not who he is at all. He is more Jay Cutler or like a souped-up Ryan Fitzpatrick where the highs are going to be great. I mean, we've seen him make some incredible throws, make mm -hmm. some incredible plays, and sometimes he could put it together and have an incredible game. He's had like two five-touchdown games versus the Bengals. That's incredible. And then there's the flip side where he'll throw four interceptions in a game. He's had multiple of those, right? I think he had a couple against Baltimore, um, and then he had one against Green Bay last year, and he's had one every year, right, where he just throws three or four interceptions. Mm. That is the thing with Baker Mayfield, right? That I think why he's so polarizing is because the good games are great and the bad games are awful. And depending on what you focus on more is what your opinion is going to be of him because <laughs> he's not somebody who really like, he doesn't really give you average play most of the time. It's usually you roll the dice and whichever Baker you're getting is the Baker. Sometimes he gives you both in a game where he'll have a great first half like he did against Indy in 2020. And that second half, he comes out there at those three interceptions. You never know. Like, that's the thing. And that's why the Browns kind of moved on from him because he's a hard guy to build around because you never know what to expect out of him. I think his future is the ultimate transition quarterback, right? If he can accept it, where he's going to be the guy to start um, if you have a rookie, and you still want to win games, right? Mm. He can do that, right? If you get a good Baker year, you can go pretty far with that. But you don't want to depend on that, right? And, and I think that's what the Browns ran into. Um, and, and pretty much if Baker understands that and is he, if he's smart, he'll understand that that's going to be his niche going forward <laughs> is that dude, right? Because he's just not consistent. Unless he, like, develops and becomes more consistent over time, that's going to be his future, um, mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to tell somebody who was a number one overall pick. Yeah. Like if it was a third round pick, he might be willing to accept it. But that's mm -hmm. not normally what happens to number one overall picks. But, you know, he, he's he's more on the Tommy Maddox side of things than he is on the Andrew Luck side of things. Right. Like that's just where it lines up with him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, talented player, capable of some some amazing throws. It's just never going to be it has not been consistent enough for you to commit long term to it. And, you know, until he fixes that and puts together three good seasons, it's going to be the wrap on him. And I don't know if he's ever going to get that opportunity again because this thing in Carolina don't seem like it's going to be long term. Um, and, yeah. you know, after after that, after your second start with the team, you know, let now you're bouncing around. You're hoping for a spot. And maybe you land somewhere like Jameis does where you get another opportunity, but it's hard to come by. Jameis had to sit the bench for like two years to get that opportunity. Mm. Oh, man. Yeah, something that you mentioned uh, when you were speaking about uh, Baker Mayfield is uh, dependability. Um, you also mentioned the fact that uh, probably not going to get a long-term contract. Um, now, somebody on the Browns who 
has been in sort of a similar situation, but on the flip side of the ball on defense, uh, somebody who I, I I have wanted the Ravens to get this guy for the longest, but it obviously <laughs> never happens. Um, and that is Jadavian Clowney. Now, I, I just – this training camp, I, I haven't heard anything um, about Jadavian Clowney at all. Now, is that because I just simply – haven't been tuned in enough to what's going on with the Browns, or is it because he's just been really quiet in camp? What's, what's happening with Jadavion Clowney? Oh, no, he's look good. Uh, look, Jadavion, I mean, he, people say he's lazy. He's not lazy, but he, he, he's he's an older star player in the NFL, which means, mm. you know, he's not going to give you star-making performances every week. But every once in a while, for whatever reason, he decides he's going to beat Jadavion Clowney. And <laughs> you see it and you're like, oh, my goodness. You know, I think one of our beat reporters one day were like, outback bowl Jadavion Clowney was at Brown's practice today. Like, you know, hmm. some days he just turns it on and it is unbelievable how good he can be. Um, and, you know, he's not the most consistent guy. I feel like with the pressure off of him and – you know, it, it's funny when you interview him, he doesn't see himself as the Robin to Miles Garrett's Batman because he doesn't believe he's like second fiddle or a Robin to anybody. So it's kind of a sensitive subject with him. But, you know, the pressure's off of him now when Miles Garrett's on the other side when it comes to protections. I mean, the Ravens, it's funny because Miles got a sack and it was on the top 100 on one of those like triple triple coverage plays that they do on Miles Garrett where they have three heads on him. I've been talking about that for three years where I'm like, people are like, why can the Ravens block uh, Miles Garrett? Because they are the only team in the NFL that's like, I'm not playing any games <laughs> with 95. <laughs> we are committing all of this to him, right? Um, and when teams are in teams now, I mean, like after last year, everybody's just going to be like, you know what? Let's not let 9-5 get in the backfield. Let's just put everything back there. It's stuff that like, only happens for him and Aaron Donald. They don't really even do it for TJ Watt. So now that that pressure is just so much off of Clowney, Clowney can just sit there and produce. Um, and as long as he can stay healthy, there's going to be a lot there for him to produce, uh, especially when you have guys like JOK who are really good at flushing towards oh. that uh, side of the pocket, you know? Mm -hmm. That's true. JOK, Jock, mm. the guy that uh, ended Ravens season last year. Um, that was that was unfortunate. But um, speaking of seasons and, and the way that they've gone, um, you see the Bengals. They were obviously in the Super Bowl last year. Um, they lost, but they did make it there. Uh, Joe Burrow's first four year, first full year as a starter. Um, and they upgraded their offensive line. Uh, we see the Ravens. Uh, I think their biggest thing uh, this offseason is just really getting healthy. Um, but they've also made some additions to the offensive line. Um, and they, they've added like guys like Isaiah Likely. Um, and they've added some defensive players as well. I don't got to go through the whole list. But I think Ravens' biggest thing this offseason was get healthy. Um, then the Steelers. Uh, Steelers have been a team where they don't always make the, the sexiest moves, but they're still right there in the thick of things. How do you feel like the Browns stack up? Uh, with the rest of the AFC North uh, this year, talent wise, I mean, this is this is this is an incredible roster. I mean, like um, especially on the defensive side of the ball, because if you look at this secondary, right, and you look at all the good wide receivers in this division, especially when you talk about the Bengals, mm -hmm. the Browns, like they're keeping five DBs. Those five DBs are Denzel Ward, Greg Newsom. Mm -hmm. MJ Emerson, their third round pick, who's had a very impressive training camp, Greedy yeah. Williams and AJ Green, who, you know, threw 200 snaps. So it's not like a big sample size, but he had like an 86 pro football focus. Great. There's not a single bad DB in there. Um, and they kept five uh, safeties as well. So they're, they're deep in that secondary room and they feel like one through five, they can put all of those guys on a receiver and live with it, right? Like, not necessarily, it's not going to be Denzel Ward lockdown type stuff with all five of them, but they feel like with two, it can be, right? They feel like Greg's a lockdown guy. They feel like Denzel's a lockdown guy. And let me tell you, from what I've seen at camp from Greg Newsom, he looks, I would almost say he almost looks like he could be better than Denzel um, from a technique standpoint, at least, because he is, he is like, if you have a young DB at home, have him watch Greg Newsom and how he uses his feet and his hands, that's how you want to do it. Uh, but though they have those two, 
They have MJ. They have eight greedy. I mean, greedy's almost a, like lost in this room, and he was a second round pick and still a good player. Mm. And that speed in that secondary, I think it gives Cincinnati problems as it did last year. You know, they're the only team that really did not get destroyed by that wide receiving core <laughs> of the Bengals, at least in the division, right? Especially in the division. Um, I think mm. the other one was the Chargers that had a good chance that did good against the Bengals. I'm not sure what. Yeah, I know it was another team with a lot of DBs. And mm. then when it comes to Baltimore, I think the Browns are actually kind of built well to slow down a lot of what Greg Roman wants to do because not only do you have the DBs to cover everybody, you have a bigger body um, in Martin Emerson that can get on some of these tight ends. But also you have a guy like JOK who's one of the few people in the NFL from a quickness standpoint that can kind of mirror Lamar Jackson when he breaks the pocket, which is what shocked him last year, right? When he tried to break the pocket and unfortunately on the play that he got injured, JOK was just right there and he wasn't expecting that. He turns thinking that he's going to cut and JOK just was there quicker than he anticipated. Mm -hmm. That that athleticism, that versatility, and then when you can say, okay, run the ball at Miles Garrett and Jadavion Clowney. You know what I mean? Like when you can have that kind of versatility and no matter how long you hold the ball, it's a problem because Miles Garrett's coming, right? Like, so they have a very, very good defensive roster that that I feel like can hold up um, and be a top five unit. Offensively, you know, it's going to be tough. Like you can't let the Bengals go off, right? Like you can't let any team score 30 because the Browns are not going to win games scoring in the 40s with Jacoby Brissett. They're going to have to play ball control, defensive football. It's going to be real ugly early 2000s Ravens, early 2000s. <laughs> still, they going the Browns are going to be basically playing football in 4X white tees and baggy t-shirts cuz it's going to be early 2000s football, right? Yeah. That, that is what they're playing. Um, but that's the first time I thought of it. I got to use that one more often. But that that is basically <laughs> what they're playing. Um, and Oh, yeah, you know, if a team puts up a lot of points, if they're not disciplined and Lamar goes off and they let Lamar get a couple of easy touchdowns, they're going to be in trouble. So the defense has to be top tier for this team to win games um, because the offense is going to be what the offense is going to be, which is an average unit at best. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see uh, all of these teams, they match up well defensively, but also they cannot afford any of these teams go off offensively because that will be their death nail. No easy buckets. They cannot allow easy buckets. That will be their doing. Mm. No easy buckets allowed. I like that one. Now, um, of course, in the AFC or in the NFL, there's really no easy buckets. Uh, then in the conference, the AFC, which is loaded, I think more than the NFC, but there are no easy buckets. Um, then in the division, of course, there, there's definitely no easy buckets there either. Um, so what, what are your overall expectations? In closing, what are your overall expectations uh, for the Cleveland Browns this season? Well, where do you think their the highest of the highs that they can reach can be uh, or possibly even the lowest of the lows? Well, what do you expect to happen with this Browns team this year? All right, so I'll break it down like this, and this is how I've kind of been breaking it down. I don't know how many TV shows you watch, but you know how they be breaking shows into two-part seasons? Mm -hmm. And they be cheating us now. You know, they used to give us a whole season, but now they're like, oh, part one, and then you got to wait three months for the second oh, part. Oh, yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> Yeah, but this is basically what the Brown season is, right? We got 11 episodes of Jacoby Brissett, <laughs> and then we got six Deshaun episodes, right? And man, you got to split it up like that, right? Mm -hmm. I think my expectations for Jacoby Brissett are, if we want to make the playoffs, he has to at least get five wins in that 11-game stretch. Six, and you're feeling pretty good. Seven, that that that's heaven, right? Like that's that's as much as you can ask out of Jacoby Brissett. Mm -hmm. Realistically, I think there's a decent chance that they only win four of those games. That's not gonna if they no matter what Deshaun does, unless he wins all those games when he comes back, if four ain't gonna be enough, right? But you get five, you get six, you get seven. All of a sudden, week week twelve or thirteen you're feeling pretty good about your chances to make the playoffs. For reference, with bottom five quarterback play last year, the Browns were six and five after 11 games. So it's definitely possible. It's going to take <laughs> luck, but it's definitely possible. Mm. Now with that, that, that's the first part of the season, right? And we, with the Deshaun episodes, right? Deshaun probably has to go over 500 for him to have any semblance of I don't even want to say peaceful, but, you know, for people not to be in like, oh, you know, $230 million for this, you know, if he wants to avoid all of that conversation, 
he probably has to go at least four wins in those six yeah. games. Now, those six games, like they play Baltimore. I believe they play them either that's at home or on the road. It's the toughest game. And then they play Cincinnati. Uh, I, I think that's at home. No, that's on the road because they play Cincinnati and Cleveland on Monday Night Football Week 8. So they play both of those division games on the road. That's going to be tough, right? Um, he goes back to play Houston, and I think you also play like the Commanders, and then you play the Saints and then Pittsburgh, right? Mm. Four out of yeah. those games, I would expect to win with Deshaun back there, right? So I would say four plus, you know, whatever you get from Jacoby, Obviously, if he only gets the four wins, you win eight. I think that's probably the floor for this team is eight wins. Um, if Jacoby gets the five, you had a good chance of getting the nine. If Jacoby gets the six, ten, you're talking about hopefully being able to win the division or, you know, just making it into the wild card. And then seven wins, obviously, now now we in it. Like, that's just, we just in it, right? There's no worry about that. If it's anything less than that, then this season becomes about getting Deshaun ready to really start the Deshaun Watson era in Cleveland next year, right? Where he will have the rust off. He'll have a full off season. He won't have to worry about suspension. It'll be a normal year for him. Um, and then that's what we would be focused on is getting him ready. I don't, since you have so much invested in Deshaun Watson as the Cleveland Browns franchise does, I don't think there's necessarily anything that you could say is a wasted season as long as Deshaun plays those six games, because that, at worst case scenario, it would be worth it just so you can feel good about where you're going to enter in next year. As opposed to if he would have got suspended indefinitely, you're talking about him not being able to come back and reapply for re apply for reinstatement until August of next year, which would mean he would miss offseason programs, OTAs, and training camp, mm -hmm. um, and then a, a preseason game as well. So. That's a better situation to be in. I know people are talking about like the contract tolling. I don't think that matters. The Browns clearly, if they trade it for him at the time that they trade it for him, they're committed. That you you married at that point, right? Like there's no getting off of that. So um that's what that situation is gonna be. Again, the expectations I think fluctuate, but I think it's reasonable to expect five to seven wins with Jacoby Brissett. And then Four, and Deshaun probably has to win four of those last six if they want to make the playoffs. That's probably what has to happen for this team. Um, I think their floor again, eight loss, eight wins is their floor. They're too talented of a team. Everything went wrong last year. They still won eight games. Um, and they had to cut Odell in the middle of the season. Like, it was just a mess of a year last year. <laughs> but they're still such a talented group that they won eight games. So it would be hard for them to lose more than that. So that, that's kind of where my head is at as far mm -hmm. as the expectations for this team. Um, and, you know, I feel like I've gotten there from a pretty – I'm trying not to be super fan about it, right, where I'm like, <laughs> oh, we're going to – Miles is going to get the sack. Like, I'm trying to make sure that I, I know it's Jacoby Brissett, right? And I know people have a super low opinion of him. I mm -hmm. think he has a better – he has better tape and better stats than what his – what the general opinion of him is, he's just an unknown, right? People don't know much about Jacoby Brissett. People don't know much about Josh Dobbs. So people are down on them and want Jimmy Garoppolo. But I feel like you're just as fine with, with Jacoby. Um, but that being said, you know, it's going to be another year where you got to grind it out offensively. And even when Deshaun comes back, it's still going to be a couple of weeks of grind it out football. They're not just going to go, mm -hmm. hey, Deshaun, welcome back to the NFL after 700 games. You're going to throw the ball 50 times. Yeah. That would be stupid. Exactly. Right? So they can't just do that. Um, but, you know, that that's what I expect out the season. You know, I don't think the Browns are going to be in it for the division race. I think we're talking wild card at best. Mm. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, I, we'll see how it goes. I really like that uh, that TV show and the seasons analogy because that makes it make a lot of sense. <laughs> now, um, you, you you mentioned how uh, the Browns, how committed they are, um, and how they're basically married uh, to Deshaun Watson uh, because of the contract. Hey, you pay somebody two hundred thirty mil, fully guaranteed. Oh yeah, you definitely are committed. Um, but my last question before we get out of here. Do you think, because it's always nice to get an outside opinion, do you think the Ravens and Lamar Jackson are going to be able to come to a contract agreement? Man, you know, too, if you ask me this question this time last year, I'm like, yeah, they, they, they should, right? It's like a 70% chance that they just figure that out next offseason. But then this thing has been going on so long with Baltimore. And, you know, uh, it, 
this is getting into unprecedented territory where Lamar Jackson is about to play on the fifth year option of the team that drafted him does not happen with first round quarterbacks that, that often, right? We can go back from when they started this rookie contract situation. Like there has not been a rookie quarterback that's really played on that fifth year option for the team that drafted him. Like maybe once he gets traded and they picked it up, but for the team that drafted you, that never happens, let alone with the guy it's decorated as Lamar Jackson, right? Like Baker Mayfield was somebody that was almost an unquestionable, oh, yeah, he's going to get extended after what he did in 2020. He ain't win the MVP in 2020, right? Like Lamar did win the MVP in 2019. So that's like a weird situation for him to still be on his rookie deal. And, you know, then once this thing goes on, right, let's say we live in a world where Lamar, you know, probably – come Monday next week says, Hey, I'm done talking contract. You had your time. You know what I want. Boom. Let's move on. Now, if you're the Ravens, this gets into a part to where every day that goes on in the season, you're losing leverage because you get to a point to where you can no longer negotiate in the off season. Right? So once his contract is up technically, um, after the, the, I think it's the, after the franchise tag deadline, you're no longer allowed to negotiate with him unless he's a free agent for real. Um, and, once you're at that point, anything goes, right? And I think, you know, there's nothing that accelerates a, a divorce between a quarterback and a team than a franchise tag. I don't think the Ravens would do it, but the Ravens have been traditional enough to think that they can do it. So, again, the options are weighing thin for the Ravens as time goes on. Um, and the deeper you get into the season and he doesn't have a deal, the more and more likely it is. I still think it's 50-50 that he gets a deal done. I think it's more likely than not, like barely. But if, if we get into July, I mean, not July, into June, I mean, uh, January, and there's no do deal done, then, you know, it's no longer 50-50. The odds are that he's probably going to leave Baltimore at that point if they're not willing to give him the money. And it's still at that point of the year. And, the only option Baltimore has, if they don't want to give him the money but want to keep him on the Ravens as a franchise tag, then that gets ugly, right? I mean, you're talking about, I'm not signing that tag, trade me, all kind of stuff there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where it can get real ugly. And then even then, it's like, wait, only unless they're willing to do a sign and trade, and I don't know how sign and trades work with fully guaranteed contracts because that's what he's shooting for. I don't even think you can get a sign and trade, right, at that point, right? So... I don't know what the Ravens game plan is. I don't know if they've prepared for worst case scenario, but this is worst case scenario. If this gets into the season and he does not have a deal done, the odds shoot down dramatically on, on the Ravens chances to keep him. Um, and if this gets past the bye week, I would say the bye week is the last point on the And do you guys have an early or late bye? Oh, it's right in the mid is it the, like end of, the end of October. If you get past the bye week and there's no deal done, that's where I would I would hit the button where I'm like, okay, something's not right, right? Where that deal's just not going to get done. We're talking about franchise tag because that's when I mean it should have been done months ago, but once you get past that bye week, that's truly the last opportunity to do anything about this contract before it becomes something to where the Ravens might not have the control that they want over it. Um, and I know fans are going to comment down below. They can always franchise tag. And that works in Madden, but Madden is not real life, right? <laughs> you have to deal with relationships and people. And if you're Lamar Jackson, if you've led this team for rushing attempts for the last two years, you have led this team in rushing yards for three of those years. Um, and you have obviously been their leading passer, an MVP. To have me on the franchise tag is is a ridiculous thing, right? Like, I, I it's almost disrespectful for a player of his caliber and his achievement. So, you know, that that's that's where I would start to to I, I would say I would be worried right now if I were Raven fans, to be honest. Um if it gets past the bye week, that's past worrying. That's that's where you just need to start letting Eric DeCosta know that this is unacceptable, what you're about to let happen here. Like you need to get this deal done. Sign the paper, Eric, you know, because that's where I'm like, oh man, this 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 becomes likely that he's on a different team at the end of next year. Well, by the start of next season. Yeah, man. We'll, we'll see how it all works itself out. And hopefully it does work itself out. And Lamar can be uh, a Baltimore Raven for the foreseeable future. But That's not kinda... what I mean by hopefully. But, you know, I... <laughs>
<laughs> just gotta wait it out and see what happens, man. Yeah, but, definitely. But Quincy, appreciate you coming on. Let everybody know where they can find you at. It's down, it's gonna be down below in the description, but let everybody know where they can find you. YouTube.com slash Quincy Carrier. You can find me. I'm on Twitter at Quincy. What the, look, outside of the Browns, this Lamar contract situation has been one of the things that have fascinated me with the NFL. So I actually do comment on this stuff mm -hmm. a lot. And, you know, some Raven fans appreciate it because they're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. And some of y'all, who boy, y'all don't appreciate me speculating about this man's contract at all. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I do have healthy discussions, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, and again, anything to not play Lamar two times a year. Look, I want him to get his money, but I'm very flexible on where he can get that money. You know what I mean? I I am very flexible on where that happens, but yeah. we'll see what happens there. But again, follow me on Twitter, Quincy, uh, YouTube, Quincy Carrier. Also, hey, if you want to hear me talk about the national media takes, I think I have a Lamar video already up. Uh, follow me on youtube.com slash worst take where I go and attack all of the hot take shows and have my own take on top of it. Mm, okay. All right. So all of that will be down below in the description. I uh, appreciate you again for coming on and team. Keep it clean. Make sure you go subscribe to my boy Q's YouTube channel. Uh, and again, if you're too lazy to type everything out, just go check the description box. Cause it'll all be in there. So thank you again. And we out. Peace. You see my boy, he like got a made it, how to made it. Boy, he's a fan and he like the Ravens, like the Ravens. And you know just what I mean. You too, team, keep it clean. You see my boy, he like got a made it, how to made it. Boy, that's my homie, ain't that right and graven, right and graven. Shout out to Graven.